great to to join everyone for Foresight U. Uh, yes, Foresight is, of course, near and dear to my heart and played a significant role in helping me to achieve that rank. So thank you, Foresight. And especially to my good colleague, Dr. Miller, for all those years of putting up with me, especially as I served as your dissertation chair and forced you to do foresight research. Um, so speaking of research, that's what this session is all about. And I'm gonna jump to my slides because we're looking today at all of the places foresight research have gone, specifically looking at more recent research. And of course, I think there's an important uh, polarity relationship between research and application. So while I'm covering research, I'm hoping that you all will immediately see ways in which as foresight users and foresight fans, you'll see how this information will boost your practical work uh, in terms of the foresight theory. So uh, I'm currently working on a chapter for a book by Mark Runko on creativity assessment, and I have been assigned the chapter on creativity styles. And so I'm thinking uh, a lot lately about what do we mean by creativity styles? So the main thrust in the field of creativity when you go to measure creativity is to focus on how much creativity people possess. What's their capacity? What are the things that predict how creative they're going to be uh, as an individual or in an organization or to look at what they're producing and evaluating the outcomes or products that they're generating. So. Of the several hundred measures that are available in the field, by and large, most of them focus on looking at assessing creativity in terms of how much you possess. Now, you all are familiar with foresight, so you know that's not what foresight's measuring. Foresight fits into a special niche within creativity assessment that looks at creativity styles. So, as I said, I've been giving a lot of thought to this lately. So let me give you a sort of the big umbrella. Where, where does foresight theory nest within uh, this field of creativity? So it nests within um, this paradigm called creativity styles. First thing out of the gate, when we say we're measuring creativity styles, the first characteristic is that they're value neutral, meaning when we measure someone's style, we're not making a judgment about good or bad. We're looking rather than saying how much, we're looking at how people express their creativity. We're looking at qualitative differences. So they're value, value neutral, that's a key characteristic. When we look at creativity styles, according to the stuff that I've been reading, Creativity styles is most closely aligned with the creative process because we're looking at a cognitive style, how people think. And of course, thinking within the field of creativity is most closely um, uh, associated with or aligns with the creative process. So we're, we're drawing on the creative process. Um, one of the things that we know about cognitive styles is that they're going to show up in terms of personality differences. So one of the ways to understand, one of the ways to access, to measure, to differentiate, to recognize that there are different cognitive styles is that as we engage in these natural ways of thinking, what then also follows or what comes along at the same time is how we develop our personality. In fact, you'll see some of that come out in the research that I'm covering today. Fourth characteristic, because creativity is universal and creative thinking is universal, it must span different boundaries of our lives. One of the things that has really struck me with some degree of awe, I must admit, I had no idea when I started to play with this theory and then Blair, you joined me 25 years ago and I'm sure 
Blair, you probably have the same uh, thought process. The different directions the research has taken is jaw dropping. Who knew that we could look at different foresight preferences within vocation, for example. And so the three research studies I'm gonna go over today, I think are emblematic of how, to what degree foresight theory has spanned different boundaries of uh, human experience. And then the fifth characteristic when we start talking about creativity styles, while they're value neutral, of course, situations will pull on different ways of thinking. And so adaptability is specific to the context, right? So this is one of the reasons why it's important for us to be flexible thinkers, to be able to adapt different mindsets is the fact that we don't have the luxury of working in just one situation or living in just one situation or forever working on just one kind of task. And therefore we need to be able to be flexible because different situations will um, create a bias or uh, will favor certain ways of thinking within the theory. So that's sort of big picture. This is what really foresight theory as a theory, what it rests on is this notion of creativity style. So I mentioned that I'm going to focus on boundary spanning research. I'm going to go into three research studies, mental health, who would have ever thought that foresight theory would connect to mental well-being? And I firmly believe that when we exercise our creativity and our creative thinking, we are at the same time exercising our mental health. I'll go into social styles research. I, I see Dr. Ackerbauer out there. This is based on his dissertation uh, research, uh, which really looks at how do we present ourselves through foresight when we're communicating and working with others. So it's a, a really uh, interesting and compelling study that Dr. Ackerbauer uh, carried out uh, as his dissertation work at the University of the Virgin Islands. And then brand new, this just in, uh, Trisha Garwood and her research looking at how leaders create collaborative environments in small teams and how their foresight preferences impact collaboration, not as the leaders reported. This is looking more at predictive validity, but how the members of the teams experience collaboration based on different foresight preferences. So uh, what's in this for you? Hey, the 30 or so of you that have joined, uh, thank you. Uh, here's what I hope to be able to deliver to you. One, enhance practical value related to the foresight profile results to give you more material as you work with others to uh, enhance the impact of your work. For those who are interested in theory to demonstrate how the foresight theory is expanding. And then of course, whenever we talk about creativity, right? We've got some skin in the game. Perhaps you'll gain further insight into yourselves and your relationship with others as a result of these research outcomes. So number one, first up foresight and well-being. This is drawn from a, a study um, with uh, three other colleagues. What we were looking at, and I have long felt, is that um, as we work on our own creativity and we self-actualize, ourselves, we are at the same time really doing some important work on our own well-being. And so we were curious to look at how does foresight as an expression of the creative process interface with some important dimensions of well-being. And you see on this slide the kinds of well-being states um, we were assessing, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, perseverance, premeditation, sensation seeking and urgency. I'm not gonna take you through the full study. This is the correlational uh, table that summarizes the relationship between these six dimensions of well-being and the four foresight preferences. I'm gonna highlight in a diagonal fashion, I'm gonna highlight uh, one significant relationship for each of the four foresight preferences. So one that immediately jumps out is premeditation was 
strongly related to clarifying. Uh, so premeditation is that tendency to anticipate, to look at a situation and say, what might happen? Uh, what are all the things that I should be aware of, be prepared for in order to be successful in this situation? That helps to promote well-being because you can, clarifying reduces risk. So if you've ever traveled with someone who's high on clarifying, you know they have a tendency to think about all the things that could go wrong, right? When they embark on the trip, they prepare for all contingencies because they spend a lot of time thinking about all the possible ramifications of or consequences uh, of, of things that might get derailed. And that's a good thing, but if you take any way of thinking to an extreme, the potential limitation regarding premeditation is that you spend time thinking and thinking and going over the ground and going over the ground and going over the ground uh, and may not necessarily get to, um, to uh, implementation or uh, taking action. And of course, as I have a sign here on my wall, most of the things that we worry about never come true anyhow. So it may be excessive worry that uh, high clarifiers might feel. So there's an upside and a downside to each one of these intersections between foresight and well-being. Ideating, this is pretty interesting. So high correlation, significant correlation with sensation, sensation seeking. So looking to have a full experience, that adrenaline rush of doing new things. Um, when they get bored of having done something several times, they'll look for another new thing to do. So there's that continuous seeking novelty wanting to experiment. Again, this is a positive thing, but the potential downside is needing that buzz. And when you look at the psychology around this, sensation seeking uh, can be tied to addictions, right? Because you're looking to always get that adrenaline rush. And so uh, that's a potential risk um, that uh, we might find uh, ideators uh, experiencing. Developing uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, strongest correlation uh, with OCD came for uh, the developing tendency. So wanting to make sure that things are done right. Again, this can promote well-being, being thorough, being certain, being careful, being exacting, um, but this can also go too far. When you're uh, preparing a PowerPoint presentation at four o'clock in the morning and you're still tinkering with your slides because you know that you could find ways to continuously improve those slides and your presentation is at 8 a.m. and you're cutting yourself short on having a good night's rest, that perfectionism can begin to be uh, somewhat debilitating. And then for the implementer or implementing preference, this is a negative correlation with anxiety. Again, this has a positive side. So those who report a high preference for implementing also tend to say that they're not terribly anxious. They're willing to jump into a situation and um, forge ahead uh, and not um, you know, allow themselves to be slowed down by worry or concern. Again, from a well being standpoint, that has some advantages. But again, if we get locked into implementing and we have this drive to move forward, you know, sometimes it's good to have an air of caution to um, think about what potential risks there might be. So this helps us to understand. I think one of the big implications of this is it promotes flexibility. So um, in order to be a fully healthy individual, it's valuable for us to develop ourselves, to develop these states of well-being 
by recognizing that we gain from taking on all of these mindsets. We still have our natural tendencies and our natural preferences. But by learning to adopt each of these mindsets, we help ourselves to be a fully developed human, human being. So I'm gonna jump out of the share um, and, and I'd love to see your reactions in the chat box to what you believe some of the implications are to this mental health research. How is it valuable to understand how foresight interfaces with, with well-being and specific dimensions of well-being? So I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll be quiet for a moment. I'll let you reflect on that. Let your hands do some thinking as you enter uh, your observations, insights, or questions for that matter into the chat box. And uh, I'll uh, kind of review those. those. Those are popping up before I go into uh, the social styles research. Shred, while we're waiting for people to formulate their questions, I do have a question like, how did you end up, there's so many aspects of mental health. How did you, and I so I know some of the story, but how did you end up picking those and might there be others to explore? Yeah, of course. Um, so we, one of the authors, a fourth author um, is a counseling psychologist. So we were really relying on her expertise in terms of the kinds of things that come up often in counseling and therapeutic situations. So that was one characteristic um, that or one criterion that helped us to make that decision. It, what are people working on? And then the second was um, what's publicly available as measures of, of these dimensions. So the first was, are these active uh, dimensions that people are working on in therapy? Uh, and then two, can we get our hands on a publicly available uh, measure? So. So just kind of scanning. Um, so uh, Susan, as a clarifier, I totally see that I anticipate in professional contexts and personal ones less so. How was context taken into consideration? Uh, thanks for that question, Susan. The, the measure of these mental health dimensions um, were not context specific. They had people think about uh, their life in general. Um, so, uh, we didn't, didn't specifically look at one situation versus uh, another. So it's interesting that you see this applicable more in the professional arena than the personal arena, which may be a, re a, a result of comfort uh, or, or, or less pressure. Uh, let's see, Janice, I think there is a trend towards concern about workplace well-being. I think there's a great opportunity to further clarify the link or the outcome this research has in the business in business terms. Um, Janice, I think that's a really interesting insight and I'm gonna invite you actually to say more about that um, because that's not uh, something I'm terribly familiar with but I think it does present an opportunity for, this, for those of us that are debriefing foresight in the work context. How do you get into that conversation about well-being in the workplace? So Janice, you wanna jump in? Um. Is my microphone on? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay, sorry. Um, you know, what I'm hearing over the last year, uh, as we've all been dealing with our various levels of COVID craziness, um, there's a lot of workplaces that are particularly in the HR area where they're reaching out to consultants and people to provide support around well-being, right? Everybody's stressed. Everybody's dealing with more things. And I you know, having awareness about yourself certainly helps with a lot of this, but I just, to me, uh, there's a little bit that's confusing about what you're saying. And I also see that there's something that maybe we can pull out some nuggets and, and help draw those uh, conclusions for people. So not just presenting it as, you know, here's the research we did, but you know, how is this relating to some of the problems that we're seeing in the workplace right now? And as we go back into figuring out what our new work from 
home or our new work from work <laughs> model is, right? Yeah. I think I think people are going to have a lot more still to continue to navigate. So well-being seems to be very much on people's minds. Yeah. And- I don't know if that helps, but you know, I, I, I find this intriguing and curious and, and I'm, I'm wondering what else might be there if we look yeah. at it through a different lens. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, uh, Janice. And, and of course, we don't leave our psychological selves at the door when we go into work, right? Whether that's sitting in front of the computer or physically going to the workplace, we bring our full selves into the workplace. So when I'm, one of the things I'm hearing you also say is, why not deal with the full person in that context? And you know, I know, for example, um, when I talk about uh, ideating and attention deficit disorder, which was an early study, people are relieved to hear, oh my gosh, there's a different label I can use, right? Because ADD is a negative label versus ideating, which is a more positive or at least neutral label. So helping people to, to um, grapple with and understand. And I see Christine mentioned and Janice, you mentioned as well, the power of self-awareness and the ability to self-lead and self-facilitate oneself. The more information we give people about themselves, we do nothing but improve self-awareness and then hopefully self-leadership or self-management. And these connections between foresight and well-being could give people more hooks to manage them themselves and to, to build themselves. So I, I appreciate that, that insight. So um, I see lots of other observations. We're, we'll have time at the end as well for some small group conversation. I wanna make sure we get through to the other two studies and uh, since we have Dr. Ackerbauer in our midst, let me tell you about Mike Ackerbauer's research on social styles. So social styles relates to the behavior that one exhibits when interacting with others. So it's taking foresight and moving it beyond sort of just an individual sort of perspective to how do we work and collaborate and communicate with others and does foresight in some way give us insights into differences in terms of how we show up, right? How do we show up when, when working with others? And uh, Mike, you can go ahead and, and wave to the camera because I'm stealing your research and I'm just gonna give a very high level overview. I would encourage folks to uh, reach out to Mike and Mike, maybe you can put your contact information in the chat box in case folks want to find out more about this. So this is really exciting stuff. So what have we learned as a result of Mike's research? When interacting with others, we see clarifiers seek to draw out information and understanding by encouraging others to share. So it's perfectly aligned with the theory. Clarifiers will ask questions. They'll seek to draw out or pull people into a conversation. They may appear passive as they allow conversations to unfold because they're listening. They're gathering insight into what is happening uh, in that conversation or the topic of the conversation. They're trying to get a pulse on the situation. And what's interesting, and and Mike, I love this outcome because we get into the emotional side of things and the kinds of emotions people show. Um, clarifiers, and if you know people who are high clarifiers, you, you, you may see this, they have that poker face. You, you, they, they, they're pretty emotionally tight, right? They're, they're in control. So, uh, so this helps to uh, expand uh, our, our theory about uh, these preferences. Ideators, let's pick up on that emotional piece you can pretty much know what's in, what an ideator is experiencing because ah, it's out there. You see their emotions. They're, they're the opposite of a poker face. They demonstrate a willingness to take risks on new ideas. Um, they'll want to move urgently forward. There's that sense of urgency that they have. Um, and they're readily encouraging others to pursue uh, novel approaches. There's, they're the cheerleaders for uh, for novelty. Developers, 
Uh, being one myself, uh, tend to be more muted, um, Obama-esque, if you will. They keep their emotions in check as clarifiers do. Yet at the same time, they are open to novelty and they're intrigued by novelty and will explore, but from the perspective of how do we make it work, right? How do we make, they just don't fall in love with novelty for novelty's sake, but they're intrigued around how do we make this practical and, and workable? And this I thought was interesting and I can say and of one, in terms of myself, they're sensitive to others' emotions and they show concern uh, for others' well being. There's that sensitivity to the environment. And implementers, when they're interacting with others, um, they will display low levels of active listening. Uh, not saying that this is uniform, this is more of a trend. And what that looks like when interacting with an implementer, they may seem not to be paying attention. Uh, they may miss comments because they're thinking about what needs to be done, or they might be frustrated that the conversation is just moving too slow for them. Uh, they have a tendency to direct the conversation, and they could come across by projecting that they have a sense that they're clearly right. Just need to agree with me, get on board, and let's move forward. So, this begins to help us to understand in more of a social setting how each of these preferences begin to, to show up. So again, I'm going to jump out of, uh, of screen share. This is new work, thank you to, to Mike Ackerbauer um, in digesting this. Um, what are your questions, reactions? What's the value? What new insights do you get by um, thinking about how these four preferences interact differently and show up differently with, with others? And I'll let folks go ahead and populate the chat box. And certainly, Sarah, if you have a burning question or something that you saw or something that occurred to you, certainly Happy to entertain I think, the, I think the focus around listening is fascinating, that people actually, you can predict that people listen differently. Mm -hmm. And then you can coach them on how they could do that differently. But, but I think this is the first time I remember running across that listening thing so consistently across the... Yeah. And then that gets into, again, those communication behaviors, which is one of the things I really like about uh, this research that Mike did. So comments about how this is useful for coaching. Um, we know uh, Kristen Peterson, great to see you, Kristen. Um, we did not specifically look at integrators, although uh, Mike, maybe Mike did. I'm providing a high level summary of Mike's research. Mike, just so we can hear your voice, you wanna jump in and sure. was there anything you specifically looked at in terms of integrators or you can add to this conversation about integrators? There's, there's definitely an integrator style according to the social styles model that we use, that we did the correlations with. We just didn't hypothesize it and there wasn't really a good way to, to design the, the method for that. That would be a really excellent follow-up study if we were to go deeper into it. Mm -hmm. Good, okay, thanks Mike. <laughs> So I'm just I'm just reviewing. I'm quiet because I'm reviewing some of the some of the comments. Uh, so Patricia, really helpful when working in education, helping new teams understand support each other. I think um, especially when it comes to collaboration and how we might uh, show up in terms of collaborating. And there was an earlier comment about the value of social styles um, for for coaching. So Mike, there was a question about what inventory you used for social styles. Uh, we used the model from uh, the measure from Tracom. It was the multi-rater. It was the, uh, it's a, it's a self-assessment, which is a little ironic because social styles tend to be impressions that we give off to other people that we are not really aware of. So another way to reframe this would be to do a 360 kind of view 
knowing knowing everyone knowing their foresight styles uh, and also then someone else weighing in on a subject. Good. Thanks, Mike. And Mike, is there anything else that from your perspective, uh, major insights from your, I, I provided what I thought were some of the, the new insights that really extend foresight theory, anything that jumps out at you that I skipped over that you'd want to mention? No, I loved, I loved the, the nod to empathy uh, in the developer preference. It's, it was, there was a whole subset of scales that we didn't anticipate and we didn't hypothesize for, of which one was that developers have a relationship with, with empathy and with novelty or innovation, I think it was the subscale title. And so the idea that all things being equal, you look at the correlation between clarifier and developer with the styles, very much the same tendencies in terms of their affective behaviors, their, their motion and the, and the way in which they engage people, much more task oriented. And, and yet, while the, while the correlations between clarifier and de developer were very common, that was a very distinct view that, in, in fact, um, Gerard, I saw it in your well-being um, article. Clarifying involves the analysis of information where developing is focused on the analysis of ideas and solutions. Where clarifying is about understanding the current reality, developing is aimed at building a new reality. In short, clarifier is, clarifying is backward looking while developer is forward facing. And that's what really stood out to me of the subscales that we did not anticipate. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's nice to see that um, correspondence start to emerge across studies. So yeah, thanks for thanks for mentioning that. That's one of the things that I think the research that we've done lately is helping us to do is to better distinguish between clarifying and I and developing. They're both analytical. And as you pointed out, clarifying is about analyzing information and situations. It's backward looking or perhaps current reality anchored versus developing is forward looking. As I said, developers are open to novelty. They're curious about using analysis to make something novel workable. So future focused, yeah. So thanks for that reminder, Mike. And that also is a great setup to, I have to tell you a research study that in some ways is a bit perplexing to me and I, Perhaps with all the wisdom in this Zoom room, we might get some uh, insight into uh, some of the results out of this study. So let me share with you, this is the third, oh, the places foresight research has gone. This is Trisha Garwood's dissertation research looking at the impact that leaders have on collaboration. What's really interesting about this study, it's not correlational. So for example, the study that I just uh, overviewed, well, the previous two studies were correlational. They were looking at foresight correlated to well-being, foresight correlated to social styles. This was more predictive. Um, so this research looked at small teams and team leaders, all of whom completed foresight, and then the team members evaluated the collaboration in their teams. So they were reporting on their teamwork. And specifically, we looked at trust. So to what degree is there trust in this team? Can we rely on one another? Do we feel it's a psychologically safe space? And then secondarily, to what degree is there a spirit of exploration? Are we actively looking at new ideas? Are we being encouraged to engage in divergent thinking? Uh, to what degree are we entertaining novelty? So psychological safety, and if you will, to what degree is there a spirit of divergence in this team? So it's not correlational, but we were looking at, I should say, Trisha was looking at, to what degree did the leader's foresight preference impact how followers were experiencing trust and spirit of exploration. So these were the general results. Leaders with high clarifying preferences were found to promote higher levels of trust. So those on teams for which the small team leader 
had a high clarifying preference also reported higher levels of trust. I'll pause for a second there because I would love, this is brand new research just came out in the last couple of months. We're writing the journal article on it now and this presentation is all about helping me. That's why Sarah organized this Foresight U because I begged her to pull together a lot of good thinkers to help me think through why. I can tell you this is what the data clearly shows. I have some of my hypotheses as to why high clarifying would be related to greater levels of trust and feeling psychologically safe, but I'd love to hear your ideas. In contrast to that, those who reported to leaders with a high developing preference reported hmm, lower levels of trust. Mike and I were just talking about how the latest research is starting to distinguish clarifying from developing. This is a perfect example of that. Why, for one, would high clarifying mindset promote trust versus a high developing preference undermine trust, especially when we say those with a developing preference are more empathic? There's, there's something going on here. I, I don't have the answer, but I'm curious to get your insights. This is what the data shows. It's, of course, in the future, it would be nice to replicate this. It would give us greater confidence. But this was no small data set. This was a data set of 400 people, um, uh, 100, 100 or so teams. So it was a reasonable data set. So I, I don't think this, these are just anomalies. Finally, no surprise, leaders with high ideating preferences, those on teams who reported to high ideating leaders promoted said that these leaders promoted, facilitated higher levels of spirit of exploration. You know, that seems pretty theoretically uh, something we might anticipate. Now we did go in and we looked at the match between the leader and the follower. So if the leader was high clarifying and the member of the team was high clarifying, we call that a match. If the leader was high clarifying and the team member was low clarifying, we call that a mismatch. So we wanted to know, did match make a difference when looking at trust and spirit of exploration? And here's what we found. For clarifying leaders, they promoted trust for all pairs whether it was a match or a mismatch. So the dominant input variable there was the leader's preference for clarifying. And it didn't matter whether it was a match or mismatch. So it didn't matter for whom, for all followers, if you were reporting to a leader who had a high preference for clarifying, you were more likely to report feeling a sense of trust. The same thing was true for developing leaders. Match or mismatch, it didn't matter. They had the same effect on everyone as in undermining trust. But where it did make a difference was on spirit of exploration. And this is, this is kind of interesting. So when we looked, excuse me, it made a difference for ideating leaders. So when there was a match between the team member and their leader, their small group leader, where they both shared a high preference for ideating, that's when spirit of exploration went up. So I'm a high ideator, I'm reporting to a high ideator. Because of that symbiotic relationship, I'm more likely to say, yeah, yeah, there's a real spirit of exploration here. It's like it gets amplified. What's interesting is when we look at trust, trust, it didn't come up in general for high ideating leaders, but trust did go up when there was a match. So I'm on a team, I'm high ideating member of the team. My leader is 
hi ideator i report now greater levels of trust when there's that match so there's something about ideating and having a match that symbiotic creates some kind of symbiosis that promotes both spirit of exploration and and trust now what's interesting about this again this is not correlational. This is what people are reporting. And they didn't have the results of foresight when they did this analysis. So I don't think they were falling into a trap of giving us what they wanted to hear. They were simply commenting on collaboration and trust specifically as a component of collaboration and spirit of exploration. So. Sarah, here's where I'd love to send people off into a small group because I would love for you to puzzle through this and to think about this. I need some assistance. So time to play researcher and you can talk about interpretations or implications. Uh, why, why is it high clarifying uniformly promotes trust? Well, why would a high clarifying way of thinking, that mindset, promote trust? Why would high developing hurt trust, which it did uniformly. And why would this match be so important between leader and follower when it comes to an ideational mindset? Why do we find that only for ideating? That match made a difference, that a follower and a leader who share ideating, that ends up being multiplicative. So those are the questions I'd love for you to puzzle through. And if you don't want to, you can have a conversation about whatever you wish to talk about, the, the fine weather, wherever you're living. But if you want to have a, an intellectual uh, discourse, I would encourage you to do that. Sarah, we've got, um, oh, it's my time. It's about a quarter to the hour. What do you want to do to give, give folks eight minutes? Sure. So much to unpack there, I don't doubt. <laughs> Sorry to drag you back into the, the collective. Gerard, yeah. can I set you back up? And yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. And, and we just, I was in group six and Jeremy was uh, just sharing something. And, and Jeremy, let's, let's, that last point, if you can remember what it was where you were talking about the ideating match versus mismatch. And it sounded like you were going to make a point or, or make a question that might be good for all of us to to kind of think about. So we, we were talking about how clarifiers can reduce ambiguity. Therefore, that could could be a reason why trust goes up. And then when we look at ideators and ideators should send most people in the reverse because they're going to crank the ambiguity up for people. So Gerard pointed out, well, there's certainly a trust between ideator followers where trust goes up. And that kind of makes sense. But then it says no pattern for mismatch. But I would expect that trust factor to drop significantly with ideators and everybody else because the ambiguity is going up if we're following that clarifier is reducing ambiguity logic. Yeah, yeah. So, Jeremy, I think that's a it's a really, I think, profound observation uh, and good on you. So when you have a mismatch, there's just no particular pattern there. So if you're reporting to a high ideating you know, leader and you have a low ideating preference or you have a preference for implementing or a preference for clarifying, there's no particular pattern there, but where, and I was using the expression, where, this, where there's a symbiotic relationship, it's only when they align, mm -hmm. right? So it's, so it's almost like it takes one to know one, right? Like I'm, I'm a high ideator, damn, I love this high ideating leader stuff yeah. you're putting down here. I get it. I'm with you. You know, where you now see a synergy, a synergistic um, tendency happening. So I think, uh, I think that's a really, really powerful observation, Jeremy. So um, Sarah, what, Thank you. we've got just a few minutes before we are wrapping up. What, how do you want to, how do you want to bring this to a conclusion? Well, let me say thank you guys all for coming. This was a great crowd and wonderful to see you here. And Gerard, thank you for um, really compiling such an array of research. And what I 
love and want to point out is this is really primary research. I mean, this is really Gerard continuing to push the theory of foresight. Uh, and, you know, we get these, I see these research studies coming and they come in pieces and they don't really necessarily make sense to me. But when Gerard talks about it, I get all the smoke blows away from the room. So Gerard, thank you for spending time with us to share the insights that you've had. I tried to share the um, slides, these slides in chat. If you didn't get them, don't worry. We'll also send them out tomorrow. Um, but so look for them in an email tomorrow. And um, we are going to have our next Foresight U session sometime in July. I forget what the date is, but uh, Russ will be up for that one and we'll send out word for that. But can we all just thank Gerard with a, maybe take yourselves off, uh, off of mute, do a round of applause for this. This was great. Thank you, Gerard. This thank awesome. you, everybody.